King of kings and Lord of lords, lover of my soul, the lily of the valley, the bright shining star, soon coming king. Oh my goodness gracious, we could go on all night, all day long if I let all of you begin to yell out what the Bible, who the Bible said he really is. Oh, praise his name. Well, hallelujah. Well, this morning, as we come, which could be our last Sunday message, who knows? Hallelujah. Glory to God. This morning, we want to speak to you pertaining to uh, godly humility. Godly humility. Now, don't go ahead and climb under the bench uh, because you're already feeling guilty or bad. And when I just mentioned the word humility, uh, I want to explain to you, and I think you're going to be amazed and, and uh, just going to love the Lord's explanation of humility compared to what you might have been taught most of your life. I can openly say that I was saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, because... You know, religion does strange things to us. It teaches us strange doctrines. And it makes us miss so many things that God is doing. And sometimes we get so messed up in our head because of what religion has done to us. And, and we don't even know it half the time. That's because we don't really understand or know the Bible. Most of us only know what somebody told us. And if they didn't know anything, then guess what? We don't know anything. But the Lord's not going to get there and say, who told you all that? <laughs> you know, he, he makes known to us who we are and what he has prepared for us and what he's made ready for us. And we praise him with everything in us. Amen. What a glorious God. So over the past few months, we have been praying and praying and praying. And we've invested a lot of times in prayer for our nation. We've seen God turn many a thing around. We've seen him do marvelous things in our nation, in our city. We keep hearing reports even from the latest prayers and the latest assignment that God gave us. We keep hearing how so many things are being uncovered and revealed and because and, uh, God is a prayer answering God. Yes, and so, you know, we've often quoted Second Chronicles 7:14. You know that scripture, but let's, let's look at it again. And my people who are called by my name, when they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's a promise from God. That's a promise from God. Now, let me say that it's if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves. You know, most of us can quote that particular scripture by heart, and yet, if the truth were known, most of us have not paid much a temple to humble themselves. <laughs> we, 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 and, and, and particularly, have you noticed where it comes in the, in, in the scripture there? Humble yourself. Comes before pray, before seek my face, before turn from your wicked ways. Humble yourself. And we just kind of go past that thing. And come to, well, let's pray now. And let's seek the face of the Lord. Humble yourself. What in the world does that mean? It doesn't mean being a wimp. I can tell you that right up front. It doesn't mean any of that. You know, humility is called the queen of all virtues. And most of the church ever talks about it. I haven't talked about it much. And I hadn't heard very many people talk about it. But religion has given us a crazy definition or made us look at what humble yourselves mean. It usually meant through a lot of people, no jewelry, no makeup, ugly in other words. <laughs> I mean, no jewelry, no makeup, you know. Oh my word, cover up every found to here and here and here. No, no. I never did get it why you don't let your toes show. That, oh, I never got that. But anyway, anyway, and you know, in other circles, it meant that you were uh, poverty, that you lived in poverty. And all of that made you and showed everybody how humble you were. No, it didn't. Because we all talked about how crazy you were. <laughs> Look at them. And you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, you know I'm not, the difference between me and these, I'm here on the microphone expressing it. 
and you're thinking it or have thought it. You know, my friend, of course, Miss Lillian, who was here for all those years, you know, when I first met her, uh, she was very much involved. And I'm not knocking, it sounds like I am. Yeah, it does sound like that. It sounds like I am knocking the whole uh, uh, deeply Pentecostal movement, and I'm not. But you know, we take everything to the extreme. And, and the Bible doesn't do stuff like that. God is far more kinder than we are. But when I met Miss Lillian, she was, in, she was in, uh, deeply involved in, in old time Pentecost and, you know, had long hair and no jury, things I just described when I met her. I did a message years ago about who bewitched you. Years ago, probably, I don't even know, probably 25 years ago, a long time ago, 30, who knows. But uh, she got hold of that message. And she said when she, I don't know how she got it, but when she got it, she said that she took it and, and she was somewhere and she took it to her, in her motel room and and she listened over and over and over to it. And, uh, and in that particular message, I talked about things like this. I hardly even remember the message, but anyway, it comes out of Galatians for those of you who are wondering where such a thing came from. But anyway, as I talked in, in that message, she, she said it so ministered to her, uh, I, I did not know her at that point, that she went back and uh, cut her hair, now, now, she was a leading figure in, 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 the, in the Pentecostal movement where she was. And she went and told her husband, and she cut her hair. Now, he wasn't quite as much involved in it as she was. But she, she cut her hair and, and uh, all kind of things. I don't think she went so far as put on any lipstick or anything. You know, the, the devil's rouge and stuff. I don't think she went that far. <laughs> but anyway, and, and then right after that, Right after that, um, strangely enough, they didn't, they didn't, you know, fire from her position. I think she had to sit down a little bit, but because she was on the platform all the time, I think they made her sit over to the side. But anyway, uh, I met her in a meeting. She and I were both on a program together, and we we're up close to New York. And uh, <laughs> I talked to her, and let's go into New York, and I bought her jewelry. And, and you know, now, I mean, I, I bought, I, I said, I bought her this and I bought her that. And I said, you need to put a little here and a little there. And a little. I dolled that lady up. <laughs> and we were preaching. And uh, sent her home. And then uh, she said she'd never been so free in her life. Of course, about scared everybody to death when they saw her and, and, and all. And she had to, you know, come out of some of that. But anyway, uh, it, it was, you know, I, I, for a long time I said, Lord, I pray that that is not on my record that I led her astray <laughs> in, in any kind of way. And, uh, but, you know, I can hear the Lord laughing about it right now. You know, he said, where did y'all come up with that stuff to start off with? But anyway, uh, the things that we have done, and we called it being humble, you know, humble. And we have defined uh, humility by external appearances. And, and, and that's about as far away as you can get from what the Bible talks about when it talks about humility. Now, let me say this before I get letters and things. I hope I go up before they all come in, Lord. But from the emails and the letters and things. You know, everybody has a right to, if, if you don't want to wear any makeup or anything and you want to be a part of, a, of an organization and that's what your heart's conviction, then fine. That's perfectly fine. But don't do it because you think you have to right, right, right. or that the Bible says that you have to. Right. Everybody has a right to their own conviction as long as it is biblical and trying to do something for God. But, but not, I, I, I don't, just don't write me. So anyway. <laughs> If I don't hush, I'll get worse trouble than I started off with. But you know what I mean. So we have been preparing ourselves for the coming of the Lord. And it, it's vital, of course, that we watch the signs of the times and what's happening and everything that's going on. But it's strictly, I mean, just as much or more vital that we pay attention to our hearts. Right. And, we, and we pay attention and we examine our hearts 
in regard to fundamental things, and I'm going to put it to the top of the list, that we kick up what the Bible has to say about humility. And you say, well, what does that have to do with the coming of the Lord? Well, I'm about to tell you. It works right in with the coming of the Lord. You know, that the only time Jesus commanded, he said, learn of me, it had to do with humility. He didn't say, learn on me how to preach, how to pray. He didn't say any of that. He said, learn of me pertaining to humility. Right. Now, I know you like me. You've never paid attention to that. Or some of you didn't even know that. And I thought, well, Lord, help. Did you sneak this in last night? Have you ever read the scripture and thought, where did that come from? Oh, yeah. I've read this a dozen times, and here it is right here in front of me. Well, this is one of those kinds of things. He didn't, he didn't ask us. He didn't say, I'm going to teach you how to cast out demons. Or I'm going to teach you how to, to do this or do that. He said, learn of me pertaining to humility. And so I wanted to know, well, what in the world does that mean? And we know that the Bible only calls one person the most humble man in the world. Moses. You remember? Most, the humble man on the face of the earth. Let's go to Numbers 12 because this is where the message comes from. Numbers 12. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. You know, we need to underline and the Lord heard it. I mean, like he's hearing everything I'm saying. And get this, he's hearing everything you're thinking. Right. So, I mean, the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out to the tent of meeting. Can you imagine the nervous breakdown the three of them almost had? <laughs> I tried to put myself in scripture and I thought, oh, you know, you three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. Oh, my goodness. And he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid? Oh, Lord Jesus. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them and he departed. But when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, I beg you, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. Oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Moses cried out to the Lord saying, Oh, God, heal her, I pray. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hazroth and camped in the wilderness of, of Paran. Now, interesting enough, you've got to understand if you want to really know what's happening here, you've got to look at a couple of things. We've got Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. Miriam was about 11 years older than Moses, and three or four years older than Aaron. Now Moses was 40 when he left Egypt, and he went to Midian, and he was 80 when the Lord appeared to him, and, and uh, in the burning bush, which, of course, many theologians said no such thing happened, and then they try to say it happens in the, 
happens in the wilderness all the time and blah, 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 blah. You know what they do. And, uh, and he sent him back to Egypt at the age of 80 to set the Israelites free. Now, how would you like to begin your ministry at 80? I thought it was bad enough beginning at 40 because that's when I started. But, I mean, started the church. I certainly had been doing ministry prior to that. This event that we read about in Numbers 12 happened in the second year of the 40 years the Hebrews were wandering in the wilderness. Now stay with me. I want you to grab hold of this. That means that when Miriam and Aaron came against Moses, Moses would have been 81 going on 82. And Aaron would have been 88, and Miriam would have been 92. Now, get this. They were the leadership of 3 million people. Now, what am I trying to say? Don't turn your nose up at old people. That's really not in the notes. I just want to say that personally. <laughs> It's interesting. No, this is not the time when people live to be six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years old. No, this, this isn't when this happened. Now, they should have known better. Amen. They should have known better than that. Aaron was a priest and Miriam was a prophetess. The Bible tells us that in Exodus 15, 20. It calls Miriam a prophetess. What in the world got into her? to criticize her baby brother at that time. Moses had married Zipporah. I mean, he had married when he went back to and went to, to Midian. I mean, 40 years. He'd been married to the woman 40 years when they're carrying on about it. And, uh, you know, after he had killed the Egyptian, then he'd, you know, run away and gone. Well, he had a, 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 apparently immediately married this lady. And so, so clearly something else was going on here other than just they were mad that he married this Cushite woman because, again, he'd been married to her for 40 years. you got to also remember they hadn't seen him either. Uh -huh. Keep that in mind. He'd been gone 40 years. Yep. He left at 40. The Lord hooked up with him at, you know, when he was 80. And remember, he died, wasn't he, 120? So there are three forties in his life. So something else was going on. Now, you, you also have to remember this. Well, I just said it, but you've got to remember it. That all three of them were involved in the leadership. All three of them. But they were not the leader. Right. Right. They were not three leaders. There was one. Even after Moses' father-in-law came and they put 70 helpers around him, there were not 70 leaders. There was one. Even after Moses went on to heaven, there still was one. His name was Joshua. The Lord did not believe in calling committees together to try to get everybody on the same plate. Lord help, they'd still be meeting today. If it was with those 70, that's for sure. So, uh, when they used what they considered a sin against Moses, this is what they said. He'd married a foreigner and not an Israelite, but had done so nearly 40 years earlier. They were getting on to him about it. So that's absurd. That's ridiculous. There's something else happening here. You know, you have to hear what people say, then hear what people say. You know, so here we have, this had nothing to do with Moses' wife. I mean, let's be real. It had everything to do with an attempted power grab. Right. Yeah. Stay with me. A disrespect for Moses and even more a disrespect for what? That God had called Moses. Amen. They didn't care God had called him. It didn't matter to them. They wanted power. Yes. They wanted power. Uh, they didn't come against Moses. The Bible says they came against God. That's what the Bible said. Chapter 2, uh, go back to the same scripture, 12, 2. And it says, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. 
Wow. See, Miriam was the, was the ringleader in this situation, and she gave kind of a half-proof. Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? Certainly the Lord speaks through elders. We know that. And had certainly spoken through her, or the Bible would not have called her a prophetess. And the Bible called her that. And every honest leader, honest to goodness, you welcome somebody, you know, who's walking with the Lord and, 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 and somebody that you respect, be it a, a prophet or an apostle or another pastor or another leader or somebody that you know God is in their life. You welcome their input. You know, I have for years, you've heard me say it. I have for years when leaders of people would come in. I would constantly say we had an advisory board, not of this church, but of, of ministers out that, that uh, I submitted to. I submit to the board here, but also submitted to a group of ministers that I would, I would call and say what you think. Well, I think this, I think that. Or when they would come to speak, I would say, if you see anything out of order, or you see anything, feel free to address it. I mean, who do we think we are? We all need help. We're not, we're not an island unto ourselves. You know, none of us, none of us. But Miriam's stance is defiance. And the Lord heard what she did and what she said. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. Now the man Moses was very humble more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, now you would have thought, well, humble, we'd say, well, he wouldn't, even, he wouldn't even say anything. That's not what it means. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out to the town of meeting. Ooh, I got something to say. So the Lord himself took offense at the accusation, stepped in. He decided he was going to take care of it. He was going to handle it because he's the one who had appointed the man and they had been disrespectful to whom he had put in place, whom he had chosen and called. Look at verses 6, beginning of verse 6. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. We're reading it again because I want you to get it. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and, and Miriam. And when they both came forward, the Lord said, Hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision, and I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He's as faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why well, then were you not afraid to speak against my servant and against Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. Now, you, know, I, you can imagine things that were going on. You can, you know, I doubt the Lord said, I don't know if it or not, but you can think, Miriam, you know, uh, Moses is the one who saw the burning bush, did you? Well, all right. uh, hello. Moses heard what I said to him and the instructions I gave to him and what I openly spoke to him. Did you? What do you think you're doing? And this is God saying this. He may be your brother, but he's my servant. Wow. Moses has done what I called him to do. And now that he's led you out of slavery, now you want to challenge him? He got you out of Egypt. Now you want to challenge and take the lead. Now you want to be in charge. Really, Miriam? This is the same mistake that Jesus' brothers made. They didn't pay attention to him either. Brothers and sisters, to be honest. You know, he did have sisters. So, I mean, they grew up in the same house with him. They missed his entire earthly ministry. Simply because... The same fleshly principle that Miriam dealt with. Knowing people after the flesh. And not after the spirit. You know. Matter of fact, Paul addressed it in 2 Corinthians. There from now, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. 
Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. We, we don't deal with him the way we dealt with him before. You know. So now let's go back to Numbers 12. Let's go to verse 10. Numbers 12, 10. Now when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow, and Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous, and Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, I beg you, don't, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we've sinned. Oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. You know, interesting enough, I can imagine the shock it was to Aaron and Moses. Moses didn't know this was going to happen. When they turned and saw, you know, the sister, the elder sister, lepers. And uh, you can imagine what, what might have happened because lepers were called living dead at that time. Interesting enough, also, Aaron had been silent, had you not noticed. He hadn't said very much until he looked and saw what had happened to her. And then he turns and said, we've acted foolishly. We've all sinned. And then, then he acknowledged what had happened. How did Moses feel about all this? See, you and I would say he's the most humble man on the face of the earth. And he was, you know, he might have just been kind of wimpish. Or, he, or they had come against him. He could have said, Ha, huh, you deserve it. Wow. Don't think people haven't said things like that because they have. Yeah. You know. Well, how does Moses feel about all this? Put yourself in his shoes. You know. How would you feel if somebody had come along, drug up something in your life 40 years ago? That's exactly what Miriam did. And Aaron. I mean, he didn't say I mean, he just he consented to it because he didn't say nothing. That's right. And how would you feel? I can tell you, you can feel pretty bad. I can tell you that. Because I've had many a person pull up things. I've had many a person try to pull up things, right, wrong, or indifferent, before I moved into this place and just slandered you with it and trying to knock your feet out from under you. Yep. Things long gone. Long gone. My goodness. So, I, I mean, I can just imagine... You know, there was nothing redeemable about what Miriam had done. You know, you know, I mean, Moses had a right to be angry, mad, disappointed. He had a right to feel all those things. But I can just imagine how some of you would have reacted. I know how I might would have because I know where I've been. But without hesitation, verse 13 In verse 13, it, says, it simply says, Moses cried out to the Lord saying, heal her. It takes a healthy amount of humility, I want to tell you that, to immediately pray yes. for those who have abused you. Yes. Healthy amount of humility. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord's humility is in a minute. But it was a, a healthy form of it. It takes a healthy amount of, to forgive those, somebody real quickly. When, uh, and you refuse to lash out and hold a grudge because I promise you everything in you wants to do it. Right. Everything. In it. But Moses asked God to heal her. But God's reply, interesting enough, was to discipline her. Even though he did heal her, he did respond to Moses' prayer, but there was a discipline that had to take place. The Lord didn't overlook the discipline. I mean, he talks about it here in the scripture. Put that back up, y'all. Thank you. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? In other words, Moses said, please heal her. Moses wanted the thing to be over with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the Lord had a different answer. The Lord said, if she had spit in her father's face, she'd been disciplined for seven days. Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days. And the people couldn't move. They couldn't do anything until Miriam came back again. That's pretty interesting. 
The Lord is saying, okay, I'm her father. I'm your father. I've chosen whom I've chosen. And I'm doing to Miriam what needs to be done to chastise her for going against my anointed leader. She's a prophetess. She should have known better. So Miriam was expelled from the camp. Now put yourself in this for a minute. That doesn't mean that she was just beyond the boundaries of the camp. You know, she wasn't within spitting difference, you know, right outside the camp wall. It didn't mean that because she was a leper. You had to be so far away. Read the Bible. You had to be so far away. So she was put out there quite a distance all by herself in the wilderness. A wilderness that had wild animals that, ro that roamed around in it. And where in the daytime it was hot, nighttime it was cold. She was out there by herself. And it was dangerous. And the whole camp, the whole trip had to be put on hold. Because of one person. Actually, two. Aaron finally came in and said, you know, you know, I... I I, I, we both acted foolishly. But do we ever think about what we say and do? What it can do to others and how you can stop a whole move of God? Just by attacking because you don't like it? And you want to, you know, you want to change it? You want to do something about it? Are you, they didn't put you in the role you wanted to be in? They didn't let you sing. They didn't let you preach. I can preach as good as she can. You can probably preach better than I can. But is anybody listening? Yes. Now, for seven days and nights, she was alone. Who did she deal with? Herself. And a whole nation. Three million people stopped. I want to tell you something. If anything should teach us that God hates pride and hates arrogance, Miriam's experience should do that. She returned to camp, a humble woman. Matter of fact, we don't ever hear from her again. The only thing we hear in Numbers 20 is that simply that Miriam died there. That's all we hear. But well, we'll do well to pay attention to two Proverbs, Proverbs 11:2. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before fall. So let me answer the question. What is God's humility? This is the most precious thing. What is godly humility? What is it? It's being comfortable with who you are in the Lord and therefore able to love others without competition, comparison, and jealousy. Godly humility. Jesus said, learn of me humility. Let me read that definition to you again. Being comfortable with who you are in the Lord and therefore able to love others without competition, without comparison, or without jealousy. I could put it this way, being content with what God has given you to do and doing it to the very best of your ability. You need to write that on the tablet of your heart. Being content with what God called you to do if it's clean the toilets. That's right. Whatever it is, pick up trash in the parking lot. Straighten up the seats. Whatever it is, being content or where you can serve him and doing it to the very best of your ability. And it also means that you're thankful for what God has done and you're thankful that God is allowing you to do what you are doing. And that you respect what somebody else is doing and you respect their journey. Amen. 
you respect them. And it always gives you a heart of being a servant. Real humility. You want to be a servant. You want to be a servant. The picture of humility in the Bible is one of a strong person, not a wimp. Philippians 2, 3 says it. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. You know, the angels of the Lord in their position, their created position, you know, the Bible says that they are, they serve God and they serve us. And they do it with joy. They're not trying to bump around. There was a group that tried, but they aren't there anymore. And all of it had to do with pride. The whole thing had to do with pride. See, pride comes in, and if pride is trying to rule and arrogance is trying to, inside of us, humility is out the door. I mean, you can't act like you're such a humble somebody. And you're so prideful and arrogant. God hates those things. And it was that whole crowd that was thrown out because of pride. Arrogance, pride. I don't want to be thrown out. Lord, forgive me. I'm telling you, I said, oh, Lord God, please forgive me for any arrogance or pride. Please forgive me. Don't act like you've never had it. You have. Lord, please forgive me. I mean, you, you know, you take care of you, honey. I'm praying for me. It's every man for himself. Lord, I mean, I, I don't want pride in me. I don't want arrogance in me. And when I've showed it something, forgive me. And if I've shown it and you've seen it, you forgive me, please. I don't want it in my life. I don't want it. I don't want it in my life. Man, the results are just too disastrous. It's also recognized, and humility is recognized, that you need God's help. You need God's help. And knowing you can't do anything by yourself. You think you've got so many abilities and so many things. You can't do anything without him. Oh, I mean, you can put on some kind of show. But that anointing won't be there. And the blessings of God will not rest on you. Hallelujah. And you begin to thank God for your talents and thank God for your abilities and your gifts. And you give him all of the credit yes. for anything you've ever done. Yes. You know, I've said from day one, I've had no idea what I was doing ever since I started doing it. And that's the truth. I didn't ask for this job. I didn't plan for this job. And let me make it very clear. No matter how many times I went to seminary, they sure did not teach me for this job. <laughs> I mean, being ordained was what got me tossed out and guns coming at me. So, hello. So, I know that apart from him, I can't do anything. Amen. And let me say this too. People say it to me all the time. Oh, you can, we just ask for her. She can, she's got it in her. It's, it's just in her. She can just do it. No, it's not. It may be just in me, but I don't know it's in there until the Lord tells me it's in there. I mean, I come walking in, oh, dear God, if you don't help me, I won't even make it through this message. I go in and speak a group to 20 people or 30 people or 10 people and I say, Lord, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I don't know what to say. See, you have no idea. You have no idea. Oh, you just got it. You've been preaching all them years. You just got it down in you. It's just going to roll out. It's nothing to you. Come on up here. Well, I can come on up here and stand. <laughs> but if the Lord don't flip some kind of switch, honey, I'm just standing. I'm dependent on him. Can't do it without him. I'm the type who came in that would sit on the back row. I'm a back row Baptist. 
I would sit back there until I learned to come under the spot where the anointing comes out. You get on up closer. There is something about being up close because there's so many distractions in other places. But no, I didn't want to stand up in front of anybody and do anything. No, no. And you know, when you're humble, you don't have to win every argument. Now, I have to admit, I like to win the argument. Y'all look so glorious. Don't you like to win the argument? I like to win the argument. I like to say, I told you so. That was my natural nature. But honey, I've lost a many a one. I'm here to tell you. And when you're humble, you can respond to unfair treatment without seeking revenge. Instead of saying, I'm going to get you for that. You know, and you're wondering when they're going to do something. And when you're humble, you don't act like, have to act like some kind of big shot. Matter of fact, the better you know God, yeah. the least you have to prove. Amen. You can get yes. comfortable with him. Comfortable with God. I don't mean that. I don't mean that. In, you, you always honor him. Right. But I mean, you, you learn how to trust him. Yes. You learn how to, he's not going to get you for anything. That old song, God's going to get you for that. No, he's not. He came to set you free from the one who got you for that. There's a devil who got you for doing that. God didn't get you. God didn't throw you into that. Do you know that sin is a choice? I mean, have you just learned that today? They didn't mean to say that, Lord. What are you going to say? You know, and when you're humble, you can respond and learn from criticism without being defensive. Amen. Whether it's deserved or not deserved. Right. Yeah. I didn't say it didn't hurt. Come on. That's right. But you don't have to beat your way out of the box. Right. Right. And you learn, you know, God's going to help me with this. Yeah. And you can be aware of your failures without being emotionally devastated. I don't know about you, but I made a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. Until it's relatively easy to say, I'm sorry. You know? I mean, I, I know people to this day who have never said they were sorry for anything. They just can't bring themselves to say it. They just can't say, I was wrong. I still people do. I just, they can't. I was wrong. Did you know it would help a whole bunch of marriages if somebody say, I was wrong? Amen. I did that wrong. I was wrong. Amen. You were right. I handled that wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. And when you're humble, you can apologize easily. And when you're humble, you can talk, you know, lovingly and Regardless of the situation, even if you need to be firm, and you have to be firm, you can't back up and be a wimp. When you stand on the Word of God, you stand. You know, you just stand. And if we're here Thursday night, I'm going to still be here. And all y'all can say, nah, 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 you were wrong. Well, I'll say, whoo you better hang on because I'm going to be right sure as the world coming up. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because he's certainly coming. Yeah. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You better not let you. You better get it all right. And you can. You don't have to be ugly or abrasive. Yeah. Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up. This is an amazing scripture. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. 
He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. Reminds me of Abraham, looking for a city. Amen. I'm looking for a city. Glory to God. See, humility comes by a choice too. Amen. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Do you, do you know what that really meant? He was being raised as heir to the throne, church. Come on. Yep. You know, he didn't have a two-car garage. Come on. You know, he owned the garage business. Come on. I mean, <laughs> he was on his way to become the richest, the wealthiest, the most powerful man in the then known world. That's who he was. And he would have not only had lands and houses, he owned the land. There was no one. He was being raised to do this. Wow. What made him give it all up? What made him give it up? Let me say this. I ain't given up anything. I've gained a lot Amen. from serving the Lord. Amen. Sometimes we act like we've done something really big for the Lord for giving up the sin. Give me a break. You're on your way to hell. Come on. You're going to hell and you act, well, I quit doing that for Jesus. Really? If there ever was an example, listen closely. If there ever was an example of how powerful the influence on the first five years of a child's life, Moses proves that principle. Better listen to me. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he won't depart from it. What his mother planted in him during those early years with the deep was in his soul when he was 40. Now you have to understand is that he refused to continue being called an Egyptian when he knew he was an Israelite. His mother told him who he was. If you remember, Pharaoh's daughter, you remember, got the baby out of the Nile and asked the sister, Miriam, did she know somebody that could help? And she brought the mother. Right. And the mother raised him until he was weaned at five or six years old. She told him because she was the teacher. She was the caretaker. And what she put in him in those first Six years at the max, probably. In those years, he acted on at 40. Amen. He actually acted on it before then, but he took a major step at 40. Yes. Wow. Wow. So for the next 40 years in the desert, tending sheep, Moses attended the school of the Spirit. No longer the master of the house but a servant to a foreign employer, no longer telling others what to do, but being told what to do. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about, well, let's put it this way. It was a, an enormous demotion from palace to sheep pen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. From privilege to pop, to being a pauper. Right. By choice. He refused to be called an Egyptian. He knew who he was. And in that teaching, the mother told him about the coming Messiah. And it stayed with him. Don't think children aren't paying attention. Don't think it's not important what you do those early years. I'm telling you. You see, the greatness of his calling 
to set, people, uh, to set free the children of Israel, demanded a humility that would bear with the immaturity, the selfishness, and the fickleness of three million people. Because they were half crazy. You do know that. <laughs> Read the story. I mean, I mean, every other day they were complaining. One day, oh, we do whatever you say, Lord. We with you, Lord. We with you. Whatever you say, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We would do it. Take me back day after tomorrow. Take me back to Egypt. Did you bring us out here to die? Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Have you ever lived your life up and down, up and down, up and down? I have. One of the things that the baptism of the Holy Spirit did for me was helping me even out better. And I praise him for it. God had to be a, and put Moses in a place to be grounded in humility in order to deal with that whole crowd so that he could trust him with the ministry he called him to. Three million people. Forget about the donkeys and the goats and the dogs and the, oh, no pigs, no pigs, no pigs. <laughs> But all the other, everything that came out with them. Yes. Wow. Wow. You got to understand, Moses didn't have a road map. Right. Google was not on his side. <laughs> he didn't know where he was going. He certainly didn't know how long it would take him to get there. My goodness gracious. Some that could have taken 11 days, 40 years. Oh, because of the stubbornness, the pride, the arrogance. We know more than you do. Who do you think you are? And by this time, don't think they weren't saying things like, God spoke to you. God appeared to you. God told you, well, who is he? I am that I am. Huh, what an answer. <laughs> who am you? <laughs> <laughs> That's God's answer. I am that I am. Well, who am you, really? Who am you? <laughs> See, we don't ever take time to think about things. See, if Moses did not know that God had a good plan for his life, let's put it this way. You can never be fully humble without having faith in the goodness of God toward you. Amen. If you don't know that God is good, that God is on your side, that God loves you, that God has ordained, that God is directing you, that God's going to guide you, that he's not going to do you in, that he's on your side, that you really are his favorite. Yeah. If you don't understand those things, you won't have faith to be humble because being humble means I'm content and satisfied in the place God has put me. How could Moses say, how could Moses, when, when the Lord said, I'm just going to wipe this whole crowd out. Me, I would have said, amen. <laughs> Particularly when he said up front, you know, I'm going to wipe the whole crowd out. And Moses, me and you go start over again. I thought, who sounds good to me? <laughs> now, you know, you would have too. Because you would have thought you, well, okay, I can handle this. Get rid of that crowd. Dear God, they're driving me insane. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown in the desert. <laughs> and... And Moses said, if you go wipe him out of your book, then wipe me out of the book. Oh! Yeah. Wow. Content. Knowing God. Yeah. Understanding the nature of God. Wow. That's a bold statement. Wow. That's a bold statement. And if you don't believe that God has laid out a good plan for your life, you'll get jealous. Or the other people's journey. You'll compete with other people's ministry. Yeah. You'll try to copy somebody else's calling. Instead of walking in what God called you to do. Because you can't do it right unless it's yours anyway. 
And all of those behaviors I just described are all wrapped up in pride. Every single one. Jealousy comes from pride. Competition comes from pride. Comparison, trying to be somebody you're not. Pride, pride, pride. Not pleased with who you are. Not accepted what God has done for you. He didn't do you right, so you've got to be like, copy somebody else. You can't be at peace with how he made you. And you can't settle in the fact that how he made you, he's going to do something unique with you. Because you are uniquely his and you belong to him and he loves you. And when he wrote your book and when he sent you here, uniquely he gave you all the tools you need That's right. to be successful in what he called you to do. The problem is you don't like it. You want to be what somebody else is doing because they look more valuable than what you think you are. You're down on yourself. And before you know it, you're disappointed in God. You're disappointed in you. And before you know it, you don't trust anybody or anything. And you become fake. Amen. Isn't that true? Amen. Isn't that true? See, humility will set you free to be you. You're content. This is me. This is me. The you that God created you to be. You're content. And you... Lord, just please let me live by your book. Whatever you wrote in that book about me, please let me stay on the right page. Please don't let me try to write my own book. As we've acknowledged before, you don't even know what you like. How can you possibly make you who you think you ought to be because you'll meet somebody tomorrow that you like better than the person you met yesterday. So somewhere you've got to, this is me. God made me. Created in his image. He made me. I'm not a mistake. I'm not an accident. I'm unique. Glory to God. Mm. Do you know that right now, this very day, God knows who's the most humble person on the face of the earth? Right now. Do you know that right now, today, God knows who's the most obedient disciple on the face of the earth? Wouldn't you like for it to be you? I said, Lord, I sure would, but oh. But you know that it's a beginning. That's a beginning. I recognize I hadn't been there. But thank you for giving me another day, another opportunity. Cleanse me, and I shall be clean. What David prayed. See, the benefits are out of this world. All that's required is humility. Being content with how God made you. Being content doing what God's called you to do. Let me close with this. Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is not my throne, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. And this is an answer. I mean, who do you, this is the Lord saying, you know, what do you think you can do for me in essence? Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you can build for me? What is it you go do? What, what do you go offer me? <laughs> and where is a place that I may rest? What, do you, what, do you, what kind of place you go put me in? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, says the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Wow. Wow. Who honors my word. Who honors who I am. Who cares about that God makes no mistakes. No mistakes, no mistakes, no mistakes. You are beautifully and wonderfully made, the scripture says, a marvel to behold. God made you, you, right. you. Well, I don't know, I can't do nothing. 
really. Maybe you better ask him about it. See, God is so magnificent, so wonderful, so marvelous, so outstanding. He knows you by name. He called you, formed you, positioned you, put you to grow into his image for all eternity. For all eternity. Be growing into the image of the Lord God Almighty. So as we learned a couple of weeks ago, that one day we can be the twin of Jesus. Is that not amazing? Yes. Wow. 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 He's not disappointed in you. He wants you to let him be in charge of you. He wants you to believe in him. And all the things that we've messed up and the sin in our life, I read in the book where he's already taken care of that. Amen. And that we will never face that again. Amen. You'll never face your mess again. And the great Beamer encounter rewards, 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 and rewards no condemnation. None. None. When we meet him, nothing of the last second will be brought before you. Glory to the name of the Lord God Almighty. He's worthy. Come on, church. He's worthy. He's worthy of all of our praise. Glory to his magnificent name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for believing in us when we don't even believe in ourselves. Thank you for knowing we can do what we think we can't do. Thank you that through you, all things, we can do them. And we praise you for them. Thank you for letting us live in these end days. May we copy Jesus and be humble, content, content, content. You know, the world knows very little about contentment. The world's having a nervous breakdown. But we can be content in the presence of a father who loves you and cares about you. Wonderful. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you've never given your life to the one who adores you, the one who knows you and loves you, has marvelous things in store for you, the one who will never throw a pass up to you when you come and repent and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you come and lay yourself before him and acknowledge that without him you can't do anything, but with him you can do all things. And when you come and, and you just say, Lord Jesus, thank you. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for wiping out my mess. Thank you that I can begin again every day of my life. If you're here and you've not given your life to Jesus, you may not know him, but he knows you. Not mad with you, not upset with you, loving and wooing you to him, wanting you to come home, wanting you to come home. Oh my goodness, what a Lord, what a God, what a God. If you're here, churches don't save you. Churches don't save you, only Jesus. So if you've never given your life to him, let me just introduce you to him. I'm not asking you to join this church. We can't save you. We know the one who can, his name is Jesus. And we can walk with you with him through the days ahead, if there are days. We can walk with him. If you're here and you've never given your life to him, would you just slip your hand up? All I want to do is help you find him, help you give yourself to him. If you're watching by internet, that's give your life to Jesus. My friend, he is coming. Give your life to him today. Open your heart and invite him in. In the name of the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and we bless you and we praise you. If you're here and you need healing in your body, would you just stand wherever?
you're here and you need healing in your body, just wherever you might be, just stand. I'm going to take the rod that the Lord put in the ark. I didn't. He did. I'm going to take the rod. And he said, there's healing in the rod. There's healing. Not just the, the essence of it, that you, it can be released by faith. And by faith, you can receive. So I'm going to do what he said to do with it. So I'm just going to wave it across the congregation. You receive. I don't care what the, the, what, what, what the reports are. The Word of God is bigger than. Amen. So in Jesus' name, come on church, lock your faith in. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, we release the healing power of the Lord God Almighty. Doing what He said to do, what He said to do, by your faith, receive. In the name of Jesus, we release that healing power of the Lord in, through, and upon you. In Jesus' name, be healed in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you. You just take a deep breath, receive it, and believe it. I believe, therefore I receive. Amen. Believe and take it in. Whether you feel anything, it doesn't have anything to do with feeling. Thank you, Lord. The pastor did what the Lord told her to do. So I receive because I, 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 I believe that your healing powers came in my body and I received. That's thanking him and blessing him and praising him. I understand that some folks here who want to, to see the rod who have not, are, and so I'm going to ask the priest if they'll just put, put the ark on the floor with a glass. And uh, they're very little, we, same amount that's been here, a little bit of manna still left. We've served more than 600 people with the thing half full. Served it on two different occasions. Still some left. Still some left. And we give God all the glory and we give Him all of the praise. We thank Him. There are those who have said, made fun of it, said that's stupid and, and done all the, you know, God bless them. They just don't know any better. God bless them. The one who believes is the one who receives. I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. I'm going to just sit it open. Brother Martin, if you'll just sit that open in the bottom so people can see. On the end, there are ancient Hebrew letters that say Aaron. I just know what it says. We sent it off to find out. Well, we sent the picture of it off. The only thing we ever put in in that box was the little Ten Commandments that are in it. We put that in it years ago. And years ago we put uh, about 18 inch, uh, about the size of my thumb, uh, just a limb out from the yard, a limb. We put it in there and we put a little plastic, plastic little, little saucer type thing with a little baby uh, plastic uh, loaves of bread. That's what we put in there years ago. And then this July, July, the, what the date was, and y'all remember? No, no, it, it came in July when we opened it. August the 4th, August the 4th, in August of last year. Smell this aroma. Brother Victor smelled it first, then Brother, then Sister G came and smelled it, the long and short of it. Then I brought the board in. We all came. I'm rushing up from my house and opened it up, and this is what we saw. And uh, what else is there to say? It's miraculous what happened. Miraculous. We give him all the glory and praise. All the glory and praise. So. We know that we've gotten reports back of many a person being healed. We know that we have served it and, and served it and served it and served it on two different occasions for communion with the, uh, what the Lord called manna, but it, it, it looks like, a, what's the little bread? The 
It's like matzo bread. We didn't put it in there. That's all we know. There's six cameras that face it and go on it. We tracked them all down. We've done everything there was to do to try to disprove all the naysayers. We can't find anything. It's just there. And I give him glory, praise, and honor. Amen. And we honor what he has done. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Won't you stand? Glory, glory, glory. My friends from North Carolina, I'm so thankful they're here. Woody and your best 40th anniversary. Ron and Deanna. Yeah, Ron and Deanna, but I mean, it's y'all's your, anniversary, right? Yes. Thank you for it. That's the way we wanted to celebrate it. They wanted to come down and celebrate their anniversary by being with us. I've known them all for so many years. So many years. Seen more miracles in North Carolina than anywhere else I've ever been. All in one happening over a period of time. I mean, fast right behind the other over years, a couple of years. We're so glad you're here. All of you who are visiting, we're so glad you're here. And, uh, you know, the burn of you have a wreck. Christine's sister's here. They're twins. So she's here from New York, but they're twins. In case you look around and think you're seeing double, you are. <laughs> so, hallelujah. For all of you, thank you for being here. God bless. If the Lord does not, you know, if he doesn't come today, we'll see you tomorrow night. We'll be here. And if he does come today, we'll still see you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. What a God we serve. I love you. You know that. And I want to thank you again for allowing me the great privilege to just teach his word to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Continue to come. Thank you so much. We're living in the end of the end of days. And uh, I'm telling you, all of heaven's waiting. It won't be long at all. Could be any day, any day. Brother Victor, will you come closest, please? Well, Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you for your word for you moving in the worship and the praise, for bringing healing to so many people's bodies today. We look forward to hearing the testimonies of all that you have done. God, we thank you for the reminder to walk more and more like our big brother Jesus, to have that humility in our hearts and our minds and how we act, how we treat each other, to regard one another better than ourselves, to think of others and not just ourselves all the time. We thank you. For the weekly reminders, Father, to move a little closer to you, closer to your heart, closer to your word, to know you more, and to walk like you. Father, we pray your blessing upon everyone here, everybody who's been watching through the internet, that the same anointing that we have felt in this room has been felt in their living rooms and offices and wherever they are. God, we thank you that there's no space and time with you and that you have touched hundreds and thousands of people today. We believe we will continue to hear these testimonies and continue to give you glory and praise for all that you're doing in our midst. I ask you to bless your people today as we go and bring us back together here, there, or in the air. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We love you. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7. <laughs>